So in this video, I'm going to review the Holy Bible 1611 edition King James Version with the Apocrypha. This time, I'm going to review it in depth. My last video years ago of this book, I did it, but I didn't know as much as I know now about the book. So now you're going to hear the good and the bad. You're going to hear a whole lot more information. We're going to go deeper. So <clears throat> let's get into it. So I'm going to open up the book, but before I do, I'm going to show you that's about how tall it is. And that's about how thick it is. Now this book is durable. I've had it for years. And you can see on the sides, it's kind of tearing up. I even had to like super glue it to keep it from. <laughs> but I mean, it's holding on. It's holding on. Now this book does come with one bookmark for free. But this book is so old. The one that I had, it came out. So I had to use my own bookmarks, but I'm just letting you know, it does come with a bookmark, bam. So you know, at least you're getting that. The amount of books that's in this book is 81. Some people say 80 because they combine one of the apocryphal books, which is the letter of Baruch or Baruch and uh, the letter of Jeremiah, I think they call it. They combine those two together to make it one book, but it's two books really. And if you don't combine it, it's 15. If you do, 14. So 80 to some people, 81 to me. So anyway, um, we got 27 New Testament books. We got 39 Old Testament books. And we got 15 Apocrypha books, making it 81. It says up here, it says a reprint of the edition of 1611 Hendrickson Publishers. And some more information. Now, we did get a whole lot of information in the beginning, unlike some of the modern translations of the KJV. They hide a lot of information to that. But if you get this, you'll see a lot of the stuff about how they made the Bible, the translators. You'll see that back then, the original translators actually did translate the Apocrypha. They didn't reject it. They didn't uh, do away with it. They actually translated it, and they took it seriously. They went by it. But people don't know that today so right at the bottom you even see the old testament the apocrypha and new testament bam it's all in there and just so some people know the kjv is not the first translation of the bible we actually had the first english complete bible in the 1300s it was called the wycliffe bible it goes over a lot of that too it goes over all the bibles before or at least a lot so anyway i'm going to skip all that and just show you that <clears throat> They did translate the Apocrypha. If you go to page 40, you can look this up on PDF. Or if you got the book, check it out. So it says, in contrast with all these preparatory arrangements and rules, we may now quote the only nearly contemporary account of the experiences of one of the revisers which has come down to us. This relates to one of the second Cambridge group to whom was committed the translation of the Apocrypha. Dr. John Boyce, afterwards, 1619, Dean of Canterbury, but at this time the holder of a living um, at Boxworth, which it is to be feared he rather neglected during his work as a translator, his biographer, Dr. Anthony Walker, writes, When it pleased God to move, <coughs> excuse me, to move King James uh, to that excellent work, the translation of the Bible, when the translators were to be chosen for Cambridge, he was sent for there uh, by those therein employed and was chosen one. Uh, that's, how, that's how I word it. And then it says, some university men thereat rep uh, repining, it may be uh, not more able. Did I, read, did I skip a line? Uh, no, that, that's where it is. Okay, it may, it may be not more able yet more ambitious to have borne a share in that service, um, disdaining that it should be thought they needed any help from the country, forgetting that Tully was the same man at Tusculan, um, and then it says, and he was at Rome, sure, I am that part of the Apocrypha, did I read it right? Yeah, that's what it says, was allotted to him, and it goes on and on and on and on. But I just wanted to get that because a lot of people don't even know that's there. But there you got it. So now we're going to get into the actual Bible. 
Okay, so now we're going to go to 1 Kings 15. And we're going to check out this hidden information, kind of, or confusion. Because when I first read it, it was confusing. So that's probably a better way of saying it. But you might not have noticed this, but here we go. So this is 1 Kings 15. And I'm going to start at verse 1 through 2. So it says, <clears throat> by the way, the book is uh, in Roman numerals for the chapters, but you can get used to it. So it says, now, in the 18th year of King Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, reigned Abijam over Judah. Three years reigned he in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Malcha, the daughter of Abishalom. So keep that in mind. So Abijam, his mom was, according to this, Malcha, the daughter of Abishalom. So, then we come into verse 8 right here. It says, And Abijam slept with his fathers, so he's dead. And they buried him in the city of David, and Asa his son reigned in his stead. So now we hear about his son. Let's see, check this out. It says, And in the, verse 9, And in the 20th year of Jeroboam king of Israel reigned Asa over Judah. And then it says, And forty in one year reigned he in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Malcha, the daughter of Abai Shalom. Now, you might not have caught it, but it just said that this lady was the same mom to Asa and Abijam. But the bloodline went like this. Okay, let's go back to verse 2, or 1 and 2. So, where's verse 1 at? Okay. So it says Abijam, and then it says in verse 2, it says his mother's name was Malcha, the daughter of Abai Shalom. So it's Abai Shalom, and then his daughter was Malcha, and then her son was Abijam, if I have it right. So, and then in verse 8, we see uh, his son Asa come on the scene. It says, and Abijam slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of David, and Asa his son reigned in his stead. So we've got Abijam, Malcha, and then, wait, did I say that right? I'm sorry, I ain't say that right, I don't think. It's, a, it's Abishalom, then Malcha, then Abijam, and then uh, Asa. That's the order. Now, Abijam is Asa's dad. Keep that in mind, right? And then it says that Asa's mom was Malcha in verse 10 at the bottom. It says, uh, I'm trying to put my finger on it, but I'm trying to read through the camera at, at the same time, and it's, it's not going well. But right here it says, his mother's name was Malcha, the daughter of Abai Shalom, the same one. How can this be his mom as well? How, now think about that. How can Abai Jam be the dad of Asa and have the same mom? Was Did he sleep with his mom? Or, now, I, well, I thought about this, right? I was thinking, I'm like, well, maybe they were brothers, but in the Hebrew it says, it says what it says. It says the same thing. So I'm like, okay, well, it's not his brother. I'm like, well, that's got to be his grandma. And then on the side, you'll see, now uh, right here, as a matter of fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you these two little lines. It's right here. It's these two little y'all bear with me. I'm sorry. It says, well, you see these two lines right next to mothers, right? And then over here it says that is grandmother. And that's what I came to, too, because I'm like, it don't make sense that that's his mom as well. I'm like, but that's Abijam's son. How can that be his mom, too? Like, what's going on? I couldn't figure it out, but I figured it out. So anyway, that's something that is confusing if you're reading the KJV and certain other translations, but... At least the King James translators put on the side, that's his grandmother. But they didn't translate it in the original text that way, but they still knew that. So anyway, um, now certain other translations did flat out say that that was his grandmother. Like the NIV says in verse 10, it says, And he reigned in Jerusalem 41 years. His grandmother's name was Malka daughter of Abai Shalom. Like they flat out said his grandmother. A lot of them said grandmother. Some said his mother. So, depending on what translation you're reading, some of them are going to say something different. So let's move on to the next one. 
Um, now the modern KJV, I don't think they're going to say, well, I don't think they're going to give you a note letting you know that that's our grandmother, depending on if you got a real, real good study Bible or not. But I, I can't be sure about all of them. There's so many KJVs out there. So this one, I'm trying to figure out why I had this bookmark. This is Proverbs. I can't even remember why I bookmarked that. Maybe I just had that there. I don't know. Why is proper bookmark? Uh, I can't. I can't think. I can't think why. So anyway, we're going to Isaiah eight three, and this one is popular. But I'm coming here to show you something that if you was reading this translation, you would not understand this or get this understanding. At least I didn't. So this is Isaiah eight three, and let me let me say this too about this book. While I'm here, because I'm looking at these eyes, and some people will say that there were no J's in the old school 1611 King James Bible. Well, in this one it is. It's J's and I's, but you can see for Isaiah, um, it's an I. And you can see in uh, this verse right here for Jotham, it says, uh, And it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, and you can see Judah has an I too, if you keep reading, the son of, now you see a V for for the U, like it's it's kind of weird the way they did it back then, but you know, that's that's a U, or you would pronounce it with a U, because how are you going to say Vizaya? I mean, I guess, I guess you could, but in the modern translation, it's a U. But and then it says King of Judah, and the I is there for the J. Sometimes they use the J, sometimes they use an I, but... And for the name Jesus, they don't use a J, they use an I all throughout the book. But for some names that does have a J on it, like uh, Jared, Enoch's dad, and um, some, some other people, they, they did use a J. So sometimes they did use a J, sometimes they didn't. Uh, I can't explain why they did it that way, but hey, that's how they did it. So I just wanted to get that out of the way. So in Isaiah 8.3... Let's find it. Here we go. So it says, And I went to the prophetess, and she conceived and bare a son. Then said the Lord to me, Call his name Maher Shalal Hash Baz. Baz. Okay, so by me reading that, I would have had no idea that this was Isaiah's wife and that that was his son. I mean, because by the way it sounded from this translation, it just says, he went to the prophetess, and she conceived, and she bare a son, and the Lord said to call his name that. It didn't say he had sex with her, and that was his wife, and that was his son. It didn't say all that, so how would I know? But if you got a real good study Bible, um, King James Version, you can find that out. My, my grandma does, but I had to figure it out another way. I had to go online. And look at other translations and do some other stuff going to Hebrew and everything um but this is Isaiah 8 3 and this is the NIV it says then I made love to the prophetess and she conceived and gave birth to a son and the Lord said to me name him Maher Shalal Hashbash so you see that's different and then the other one says in I NLT I, then I slept with my wife and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. And the Lord said, you know, so some depending on how you, well, what translation you're using and how deep you're studying it. And if you compare another translations and going into the Hebrew, you're going to find out some, some deeper, some deeper stuff. And I mean, I didn't read all of them, but if you just looked at some of them, some of them say wife, he had relations with the prophetess, you know, I didn't read all of them, but just saying, it's, it's just some extra information out there. So anyway, I felt like the KJV was holding, was holding back on me because I'm like, dang, I mean, I would have not, I wouldn't have known that if I didn't do everything I did. So here we are now. We're in the Apocrypha. So this is Second Ezra or Four Ezra, and we're in Chapter Six. This is um, 49 and 51. We're gonna go over. So it says, Then did you ordain two living creatures, the one you called Enoch and the other Leviathan. 
and did separate the one from the other. For the seven part, namely where the water was gathered together, might not hold them both. To Enoch, you gave one part which was dried up the third day. Now keep that in mind. Then it says, um, let's see, that he, I had to make sure, that he should dwell in the same part wherein a th are a thousand hills. But to Leviathan, you gave the seventh part, namely the moist, and he, I mean, and has kept him to be devoured, of whom you will and when. Upon the sixth day, you gave commandment to the earth that before it should bring forth beasts, cattle, and creeping things. And after these, Adam also, whom you made Lord of all your creatures, of him come we all, and the people also whom you have chosen. So it's going over the creation again from day one to day six and etc. But if you know the creation well, you would know on the third day Enoch was not there yet, not in the flesh. That can't be correct. And it even explains in 54 that Adam was of whom we all came from. Enoch is the seven from Adam, depending on which bloodline you're going by. But either way, Enoch was not before Adam. It said the third day. That's an error. And I wanted to point this out, but they did correct it. Um, so it says it got these two little bars right here where the first Enoch is mentioned. And it says next to it, it should be Behemoth, which makes more sense. Normally, Behemoth and Leviathan are mentioned around the same time. That makes more sense. So it should have been Behemoth, but in the Latin Vulgate that they was getting this from at the time, it said Enoch for some reason. I don't know why. Which is where this book comes in. The Parallel Epocrypha, which has a lot of different translations and the Greek that they was getting it from with the, um, what do you call it? The Latin Vulgate too. So I'm going to go ahead and show you that real quick. And at least in this um, 1611 version, the KJV, at least this one does have a note on the side letting you know it should be Behemoth, but the translators translated it as um, the Latin Vulgate said. So, or the Greek that they was getting it from. I think it's the Latin Vulgate, but we'll see. Let me, let me just see. So let's go over there, check it out. All right, so we're going to 2nd Esther, chapter six, the same one. And this is the Latin Vulgate over here. So you can, now I can't read it. I mean, I could try, but I ain't gonna do it. So if you know Latin, here you go. But this is verse 49, when we started that, and it goes and it says Enoch, the same as what the KJV translator said. And if a 51, it says Enoch too. So I get this information from this and maybe some other information, but that's what it say. So I can understand as a translator, if you got a manuscript or text of the Bible or Apocrypha and it says that, you can translate it as what it says, because that's what it say. But if you use your information about what Genesis say and other uh, texts about the beginning, the, you know, Moses didn't say Enoch was before Adam. I mean, that can't be right. Just can't be right. Just don't make sense. It contradicts, you know. So anyway, so the, the translators knew what it's supposed to be. And other translations did correct it, like the NRSV and stuff like that. But I just wanted to point that out. If you read that, you're going to see that. It says Enoch. So anyway, let's go to, matter of fact, <laughs> there's the KJV right next to it. And it has other translations. So we can look at today's English version. We can see what they translated it as. For verse 49, it says Behemoth. And for 51, Behemoth. Um, this is the new revised standard version of what I was just telling you about. It says Behemoth and Behemoth. And then we got some information down here. Um... This one says some ancient translation. Oh, that's something else. Okay, so right here it says, uh, where's the here we go? B. Other Latin authorities read Enoch. And when they say authorities, they mean ancient manuscripts or manuscripts. And that's exactly what the Latin Vulgate said. Alright, let's get this out of the way. 
back to this. So now we're going to chapter seven. Chapter seven of the same book. And we're going to about 35 to 36 verses. And a lot of you know this, some of you might not, but it's missing 70 verses. Now I researched that it was burnt in the fire and the King James translators at the time didn't have it, but I, I wasn't there, I can't verify it, but I did read that it was burnt in the fire. And I heard it was recovered and it's been restored to certain translations like the NRSV and other translations today. But back then, you know, hey, it said they didn't have it. So anyway, um, you're missing 70 verses in here. The KJV, none of the KJV translations have it that I know of. No matter if you get the small apocrypha or the red one, it doesn't have this stuff. That's even worse, actually. But um, you, you're missing 70 verses, I'm just saying. But, I mean, it's still good what they got. They got 70 verses. So that's all you're going to get in there. It goes from where well, it's just missing 70 between 35 and 36. Um, and I mean, even if I look in here and show you, you'll see like the other translations got it. Some of them got it and the KJV didn't have it in there either. I think it is some information we can get from this about it. Let's see. Might as well. Why not? <clears throat> oh, we on second answers. I got to go to chapter seven. Okay. So right here for that part, it says, uh, 36 to 105 in the Latin Vulgate, today's English version and the New Revised Standard Version are not found in the King James uh, Version as they were not in the text and manuscripts available to the translators. So they give you some information about back then, they didn't have it. But the Latin Vulgate has it, at least this one does, um, looks like it. And the today's English Version has it, um, the New Revised Standard Version has it. And they kind of say the same thing down there about the, the KJV, you know, let's see, it says, um, verses 36 to 105 are not found in the KJV, but they have been restored from ancient sources. So, you know, ancient manuscripts. And it kind of says the same thing over here too, but, you know, uh, yeah, so that's that. So you won't get those verses in here. Now let's go to, I think we got Syrach next, Syrach chapter 51. Let me go there. Um, did I bookmark it? I don't think, I don't think it's bookmarked. But this is something else that you're missing too. Okay, right here. So in Syrach 51, this is 51. This is the last chapter of Syrach or Ben Syrah and or Ecclesiasticus. And it only goes to 30. Okay. Now, if we go to the NRSV and compare. Did I bookmark that? Oh, that's Psalm 145. We'll come back. We'll come back to that. Syrach. 51. Okay, I'm going in a different order. <laughs> so this is 51, Cyrax, and we get something extra in here. So after verse 12, it says Hebrew adds, and you have about 16 or 12 extra verses. I'm not sure because they didn't number it, but this is what some of it says Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to God. I mean, to the God of praises, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the guardian of Israel, for his steadfast love endures forever. And so on and so on and so on. Like, all these are extra verses that the Hebrew adds. And then we come back into the regular um, verses of uh, here, 13. So between 12 and verse 13, you get a lot more verses. And... I don't know if it gives us any information about it. Let me see if we get any information about it. Mm. Okay, right here we got some. Okay, so it says, after verse 12, the medieval Hebrew manuscripts insert a hymn based on Psalm 136. 
So they gave us some information about that. At least I do like the, uh, the extra information. All right, so that's that. So you are missing some verses in Syrach in a lot of uh, apocryphals probably, but at least the King James. Well, I'm going to just hate the King James. But what else? we got to go to Psalm 145 because you're missing stuff in there too. Why well, I got this one bookmarked? I don't know. Move that out the way. <laughs> oh, that's my spot where I was actually reading. Let me leave that there. Okay, let's go to Psalm 145. Okay, so I'm going to compare this with the KJV. And we're going to see what you're missing in there. Um, so let's go to Psalms. I didn't bookmark it. So we got Esther, Psalms. Okay, here we go. 145 towards the back. I'm getting there. I'm at Psalms 145. Okay, so it's only going to be 21 verses if you look at it. So this is Psalm 145. And it's going to be 21 verses. You can look at it. You can look at it in the, the Master Egg Text too. 21 verses, right? Let me slide it over, slide this over. So this is Psalm 145 over here. And then um you know that bookmark out the way, I don't need it anymore. And we come on down and we have an extra verse right here after eleven. Well after, I mean uh, after thirteen. It's connected with thirteen kinda. And the highlighted part is the extra verse restored back to the text. It has a C right there. And it is 20, well, it would be 22 verses if they added that as a verse, but they didn't. They just left it with 13 and didn't number it, but that's the missing verse. Um, so C says, these two lines supplied by Quambran manuscript, Greek and Syriac manuscripts, they have been found. If you ever look at the Hebrew, this is an acrostic psalm, uh, by the way. So it's 22 letters, mainly in the Hebrew alphabet. And if you look at it, we're missing the the noon, the N letter, if I'm not mistaken. And when you look at it, every every letter is there that it starts with. Because like, okay, the way it went, I'm gonna give an example in uh, the English alphabet. If you are writing a poem, and every um, line or verse that you was writing this poem in you will start it off with another letter. So like, let's say you finish the first line, you will start it off, your first word will start off with A. And then for your second verse of line, you will start it off with the second letter of the alphabet until you come all the way down to the end of the alphabet. You'll go in order from A through Z. Now Hebrew is olive to tav. So they will start off from the olive and end at the tav with 22 letters of the alphabet, but it's only 21 verses with 21 letters and it's missing the noon. It goes from, um, I can't remember the alphabet by heart right now, but if you ever look at it, it's there. Some people know this. So they found it in the manuscripts and they restored it back to certain Bibles. So that's what you won't see in the KJV. And it could be because at the time they didn't have that available. You know, they, this stuff was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And you, what that was discovered after the KJV translator. So what else we got? Let's see what else we got. We got Mark. Uh oh, it's finna get crazy, y'all. It's finna get crazy. So we got Mark. We're getting to the New Testament now. All right. I'm getting thirsty already. <laughs> so um, we got Mark 16. And this one is controversial. Uh, controversial, if I said, didn't say it right. So here we go. Mark chapter 16. And. Mark 16, it has how many verses? Oh, that's 15. I think 16 or 20 verses. It's got 20 verses. Okay. Now, nothing is in um, what they call it, italics or something? Or I forgot. Brackets. That's right. Brackets. I said italics. I knew that wasn't right. But over here for Mark 16, as you can see, it's going to be a lot of stuff in brackets and we're going to get a lot of information. So after verse 8, up here it says the shorter ending of mark in the nrsv and it's in brackets and it says 
well, I'm not even going to read what it say. Uh, we have a D after it, and we come down to the D. Wait, actually, I skipped the C up there, so we got some information right here at the C before we get to the D. It says some of the most ancient authorities bring um, the book to a close at the end of verse eight, <clears throat> and then it says one, <clears throat> excuse me, one authority concludes the book with the shorter ending. Others include the shorter ending and then continue with verses nine through twenty. In most authorities, verses nine through twenty follow immediately after verse eight. Though in some of these authorities, the passage is marked as being doubtful. And then we come down to D. Um, where right here it was it was saying salvation. It says other ancient authorities or manuscripts add amen instead of salvation. Or maybe they add it after salvation. I'm not sure, but that's what we get. So in some well, it says in a lot of ancient manuscripts, I think it says in most actually that the um the shorter ending did it say it was there or not there? Let's see. Some of the most ancient authorities bring the book to a close. Okay, so it wasn't there in most of the oldest manuscripts, so that's interesting. And then when you get to verse 9 through 20, it's all in brackets, like somebody added this later on. That's what that means. But And then we come here, and it says, Other ancient authorities add in the whole or in part um, all of that. Let's see. That's a lot of stuff on that. Oh, wait, wait. That's why I need to read that right here. Okay, so it says um, 16, 9 through 20. It says the longer ending. This ending was probably added sometime in the mid-2nd century CE to bring Mark's ending into conformity with post-resurrection accounts found in Matthew, Luke, and John. And then it says, a summary of 16, 1 through 8, 7 demons, See, look, oh, that's some other stuff. But anyway, yeah, so that's what I want to show you, too, is some hidden information. And that stuff I found out years after reading the Bible. And, you know, it was some, it was some stuff. It was some stuff. That's not all, though. That's not all. Now, the KJV translators, they ain't tell you none of that. They ain't tell you. I, so I like the fact that uh, this Bible does. And the other thing I'm going to have to show y'all. Here we go. Here we go. We got to go to Acts. We got to go to Acts 12. And we got to get verse 4. Now, I am just going to show you. I can't explain why they did this. But I'll show you. A lot of Some people know. Some people know. So, this is Acts 12. And when we come to verse 4, it says, And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quarantines, I mean, quarterneans of soldiers to keep him intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Now, let's go to X in the other one. Same spot, verse 12. You can look at many other translations. And look at verse 4, where is verse 4 right here? When he had seized him, he put him in prison and handed him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending to bring him out of the, I mean, out to the people after the Passover. Now, I can't explain this, y'all. I, I can't. I tried to do a little research. I didn't go as deep. It frustrated me that I couldn't figure, well, that I couldn't find what I wanted to find. So I went back. I don't know if I got a print or not. I don't think I do. I went back and I looked at the verses of this, what is chapter and verse in the older Bibles before the KJV, like the Wycliffe Bible and the Geneva Bible and Tyndale and stuff like that. Some of them say Easter. I thought it was only the KJV translation that said Easter. I thought it was going to be a simple, you know, Thing that I just went and I saw okay the KJV translators was the only translation or translators that did this and I thought that was going to be the end of the end of the story but since it's other translations out there 
that say it too, that's older than the KJV, I can't blame this completely on the King James translators. I don't know why they put Easter there. Maybe, you know what, I ain't going to say maybe. Forget it. I ain't going to say what I think happened, but I think it was Passover from all the information you can gather from it. I think that's what it should have been. But for some reason, some translators put Easter. We can all come to our own conclusions and understanding or what we believe about it. But I simply don't know. I can't, I can't give you an answer on why they did it. And I don't know why the translations and translators before it said Easter too. I can't, I can't answer that. But I just wanted to show you. Different translations are going to say different things. Some say Passover, some say Easter. And in the Greek, some say, I haven't looked at all the different Greek New Testament texts. I don't even have all of them. But I've seen some say Passover. Well, I've, seen, I've only seen Passover, actually. But uh, I don't know where this Easter came from. So um, is it anything else? Yeah, it is. It is something else. No, that's, that's my own personal bookmark. Okay, so now that I got some information out about this book, the rest of this book has, when you get to the bag, it's just blank pages. And that's probably good for some of you where you can write in some of your notes. It actually gave you a lot of blank pages. And there is no maps. There is no information about the priests, what they wore, talents, you know, measures and weights and the glossary or whatever. Um, appendix is nothing. It's just blank. So it's not the greatest study Bible. It is not the worst either. So you won't get that but it is a study bible it does have cross references and it is a unique study bible and you get some greek definitions and hebrew definitions and you get uh, cross references not only just with the old and new testament you get it cross references to every book in here and you do get some decent space on the top the the right and on inside and on the bottom to write in your extra notes or cross references you do get that i do like that now sometimes if you're reading this you'll notice that the print is like not so good it seems like they were running out of ink and they just gave you those pages that were going out of ink it might not be as bad in this book but some of my 1611 king james but i only got two but uh, I found pages where the, the print is very, very poor at times. Um, my other Bible is in the car, the 1611. This one looks pretty good, but the other one I got, man. Now, another thing that you're going to find in this book um, is a lot of typos. Well, I mean, maybe back then they wouldn't, but you're going to find words that are spelled incorrect different like um i don't know if i can find any examples right now i can try but you're just gonna find it and you're gonna have to try to make sense out of it because it's gonna be it's gonna be a trip sometimes so sometimes you're gonna run into some stuff you're gonna be like what and sometimes um certain words might be or letters might be cut off and you gotta try to understand what it is you gotta be like is that a d you know you if you read it enough you, you'll notice some stuff i just right now i can't find any examples to point out i did have some but right now maybe i can find some in the apocrypha i don't know I'm in the New Testament. Because um, I know some, it's, it's just some typo errors, but I um, can't find anything right now. Sometimes I would circle it, but oh well. That's another thing you got to watch out for. And you got to get used to the old Middle English they use because. The V can be used as a U. So they will spell sometimes U's as V-S-E. And you will come at it and look at it like, 
what is that? But you would have to just say use because that's what makes sense. And that's how we pronounce it. <laughs> and that's how we well, we spell it with a U. They spell it with a V sometimes. So certain spellings are different. You'll notice that. You'll notice that. You've probably seen it as I was reading some of these verses, how they spell things different. Like, okay, here's one. Kingdom. Um, up here, they, spell, they, they got an E at the end of it. Nowadays, we don't put an E at the end of kingdom. We leave it at the M. And over here, um, where's that word poor? They have an E after poor like we don't put an e after poor i mean we just like okay right here it says shooing we say showing you know it's a little different but it's readable though you can still understand it i had to compare a lot of of the modern kjv with this because the modern kjv is more updated like cloudy they spell it like that c-l-o-u-d-i-e instead of Putting a Y where the I E would be, but we, we know it's cloudy. This is the last thing I'll share with you all. This chapter and verse is controversial, and if I said it right, here we go. It's not talked about much. It's in 1 John 5 7, and I have the NRSV on the left, the King James 1611 on the right. We're going to check out the 1611 first. So I'm going to read verses 7 and 8. So this is 1 John 5 7. Through eight. So it says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear record, I mean, witness in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. Now, verse seven, when I first read that, let me give you a little history. I had another Bible, and in that Bible, it said what this translation say before I read that translation. So, this is the NRSV, 1 John 5, verse 7. This is all my other Bible said. It says, there are three that testify. And we got a D next to it. And in verse 8 says, the spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree. That's all my previous Bible that I read before said for this verse. It wasn't until I read this verse that I found evidence of a trinity because before I couldn't believe in a trinity with no evidence. And even the people I asked at my old church couldn't give me any evidence. But when I read that, I was convinced after that of a trinity. But now I no longer believe in a trinity. I know that the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit all exist and is in the heavens. But I do not believe in the trinity. Like I used to. So anyway, that verse possibly has convinced people of a trinity. But it is controversial because different manuscripts say different things about those verses. And a lot of people are not talking about it. But this is why they differ. So let's look at the information about D. It says a few other authorities read with variations the same thing we just read in the, the KJV. So that's why this one says there are three that testify. And this would say there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Very different. Very different. But that's due to manuscript variations. How often do you hear about that? Have you ever heard about that? It took me years to find that out. I didn't know why they 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 didn't uh, say the same thing. These different translations at the time, but I felt like the KJV was giving me more information at the time, and I felt like the other Bible that just said there are three to testify was holding back at the time. But I didn't understand that it was due to manuscripts saying different things. So anyway, you can look this stuff up online. It's a lot of information on it. You can look it up in depth about the uh, the manuscript variations and about um, 1 John 5, 7. You can look at also the controversial um, comparison of manuscript differing, manuscripts differing of uh, Mark 16, 9 through 20. You can look that up too. It's out there. It's just kind of not to talked about.
but it's out there. It's good to know. It's good to know. So anyway, this is my deeper review of the 1611 King James Version with the Apocrypha. Now you know a lot of things I know. If you still would like to get it, I would still recommend it. It is, it is still a good Bible. Even though you're not going to get some stuff that they have found in the, the Dead Sea Scrolls now and restored to the text. You, you're not going to get some stuff, but it's still a good Bible. I still read this Bible a lot. And, I mean, for the price, it was it was good. It's a good deal, but uh, it's just not the greatest Bible. And it probably will never be the greatest Bible for me, at least for a study Bible. I mean, it is a study Bible. It is a good one. But you're just not going to get as much as if you, if you was to get the... Uh, the new Oxford annotated Bible, the new Revised Standard Version with the Apocrypha. This one is the fifth edition. They do have older versions that still have some of the same info in it. So you might not get this one, but that's the one that I've been comparing it with. You do get 83 books in here. You still get the main 15 books of the Apocrypha and more. You get two extra books of the Apocrypha. You get three and four Maccabees making it 83 books, but you also get one additional psalm, you get Psalm 151, and you get um, maps, you get scholarly information, you get manuscript variation information, stuff that the King James translators didn't tell you, stuff that a person like me will find valuable, maybe you do too, but so now you know some of the things I know, now you know the good, the bad, the positives, and the negatives about the 1611 KJV. That's it. So I'll see you guys. Well, I will see y'all later, most high willing. That's the review.